for coming out. I'm Jeff O'Neill, uh, Senior Director responsible for OpenStack at NetApp, and I'll introduce our panel as we go along. Um, we're going to cover uh, why does enterprise storage matter to OpenStack, and I'd like to thank you all coming out at this late hour uh, on day two here to, uh, to join us. Before I get started, I, I want to say, you know, one of the great things about this conference is that we're all, we're all together, we all know OpenStack, and, and so that's great. And we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when you go back to your, uh, your respective businesses and, uh, you know, how do people outside of, of this bubble that we create here in Vancouver, how are they uh, accepting OpenStack and, and what's the story there? So I, I created this one, uh, this next slide, he said. So the, uh, the notion is that, um, well, this is wisdom that was given to me by my seven-year-old nephew just before I got here. And he says, what happens when you're attacked by a bunch of clowns? Go for the juggler. <laughs> okay, so you can, you can take that back with you. Wisdom from Vancouver. So we have a, a great panel here today uh, representing a number of different uh, companies in this area. So we have uh, Nick Barsay from Red Hat, Pete Chadwick from SUSE, uh, Reddy Chagam from Intel, and Manu Pradhan from uh, HP. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we see happening around enterprise storage and OpenStack. So a set of themes that, uh, that came out as we were prepping for this. And uh, so I was going to ask you, Nick, as, to get us started here. And please introduce yourself in more, more thoroughly as we go. Is, uh, you know, there's a common appeal around open source technology and commodity hardware, and I know I answer this question all the time. It's an initial low cost of entry, and um, so it's, it's a way to get started. Weighing that versus successful growth, operating cost at scale, all of those issues, how do you see, uh, how do you see um, OpenStack and, and enterprise storage playing there? So, introduction first. Nick Barset, uh, Director of Product Management for OpenStack at Red Hat. I uh, joined Red Hat uh, a few months back in June when Innovance was acquired uh, by Red Hat. It's uh, been a great journey so far. I've been involved in the OpenStack journey for now six years, and that also has been a lot of fun. So, to come back to your question, um, OpenStack we, I'm going to say we because everybody in this room has been contributing, I'm sure, um, have been building OpenStack all around the notion of choices. Um, I am now in charge of a product called Rail Enterprise, Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform. Um, and when we go work with enterprise and check what their needs are, choice is very important to them. And choice is something that they need to offer when they build an OpenStack platform to their users. And their users are people building application. And when you build an application that has enterprise class requirement, you cannot offer the same level of storage that you uh, would offer to another application that has been built to, for stateless. And in these cases, you may have requirements that go up to very strong disaster recovery or very fast uh, access time. And it is not the same back end that you're going to be offering to those applications that you would for uh, the former ones. So, Enterprise storage is one of the key components that we need to enable in order to offer the choice that are needed by the various kinds of users of an OpenStack environment. Great, thanks. Pete, anybody have some data to that? Let me add, um, so this is, I'm Pete Chadwick, I'm Senior Product Manager at SUSE, responsible for SUSE OpenStack Cloud, which is our OpenStack distribution. 
and I, I agree with everything that, that Nick just said and uh, would expand upon that because we actually have customers that are looking at moving enterprise workloads into OpenStack. It's, you know, there's a lot of debate going on in the industry about pets versus cattle, and I actually have customers that want to put pets into OpenStack. And, and one of the things, for example, that we've done uh, working with NetApp is uh, enabling SAP applications in OpenStack. And uh, SAP applications have a strong dependency on solid shared, shared backend storage um, that can take advantage of things like fast cloning um, and a lot of things that, that, that a NetApp or enterprise storage products can, can provide. And, and customers quite honest, honestly couldn't make that kind of a leap without that level of functionality. My name is Reddy Chagam. Um, I focus on a couple of things, um, mostly software-defined storage architecture and um, enabling the open source solutions in the industry. Um, so I have a background. Um, my background is essentially from the manufacturing. I spent probably 10 years worth of um, my life at Intel in uh, manufacturing automation. Um, I truly appreciate the enterprise workloads. Um, essentially, if you look at the enterprise workloads, what you're looking for is uh, you know, the high availability, right? So that's one of the fundamental pillars in the enterprise workloads. Uh, reliability, right? Uh, you are looking for extremely high reliability. Um, easy to diagnose and debug specific issues that happen in production environment. Um, so having that kind of uh, instrumentation in OpenStack, um, enabling the enterprise workloads is extremely you know, key uh, for the successful OpenStack deployments in the enterprise uh, you know, private cloud type of implementations. Otherwise, what happens is you are essentially looking at test and dev type of uh, infrastructure. Yeah, you can deploy scale out, you can actually use it for maybe uh, uh, test and dev type of virtual machines, but if you, if you are really serious about brownfield um, implementations for OpenStack, specifically looking at the enterprise workloads, um, you have to have that type of integration with the, you know, the enterprise grade storage appliances that are actually deployed in a data center to be able to take advantage of that. Hi, everybody. My name is Moni Prada, and I work for HP. I'm in the product management team. And prior to HP, I've worked at NetApp. Um, and, um, full, full disclosure. <laughs> my full disclosure. Um, I've only been a year at HP, but prior to HP, I've spent 24 years in the storage industry. And, um, you know, to see OpenStack, to see software-defined storage is extremely appealing to customers today and primarily because who wouldn't want to build an array out of open source? And Ceph, Swift, and all these OpenStack services today are enabling them to build those infrastructure. I believe that the road has already been paved by Amazon and Googles of the world. They have created software-defined infrastructures. I also very strongly believe that enterprises want to do the same. And in, in some ways, you know, data is the sticky point. And Amazon and Google and Azure's, you know, you can go after them. They've built a very good industry for us. Um, but then it's proprietary. And the reason I believe that OpenStack is very attractive to enterprises because it allows them to build software-defined infrastructures from their very own commoditized hardware on their premise and create the value proposition that has been brought forth by Amazon and Googles of the world in their very own enterprise. And what helps them do that today is OpenStack. And it allows them to scale. It gives them the flexibility. They can now choose whether they want to go after open source or they can go after you know, proprietary vendors like you know, HP itself offers software-defined storage. NetApp offers software-defined storage. Many other companies are now moving in that direction. But I think the prime value proposition here is we're allowing enterprises to run their applications on the very hardware that they own and enabling them to build Google and Amazon-like infrastructures with their very own hardware, and there's no vendor lock-in. So that's my piece. Thank you, Mano. I, I think the only thing I'd add, and it's really a plug for another, uh, another session, 
is uh, University of Melbourne is here, and, and they've had experience in actually scaling, um, scaling these solutions bo using both Sender and Swift on enterprise storage. Uh, they, uh, they gave a talk in Paris, and they're giving another talk here. I believe it's tomorrow. You'll have to check, uh, search your schedules for that. Um, but you can check in. I like these where they're, you're seeing the same customer uh, coming back, the same per member of uh, the community uh, coming back and uh, reporting out. I uh, want to move forward, though, is, is one of the things that uh, comes up a lot is SLO uh, or service level management. And, you know, a lot of the ephemeral applications that you first start out on have, have no SLA, SLA expectations. As we start looking at the crown jewels, and Pete mentioned that already a little bit with, uh, with what is expected in an SAP style of application, uh, I'm curious about um, are, can we be hosting those kinds of apps and, and some examples of where you're seeing those kinds of apps being hosted. And I know, Reddy, you've looked a lot at the SLO management aspects of, of OpenStack. Uh, if it's in, you want to give us a start on that one? Sure. Um. So if you were to look at, um, you know, the, uh, in my opinion, you know, your infrastructure is not going to be uniform. Um, your applications are not going to be uniform. So if you were to look at your infrastructure, you're going to have wide variety of compute nodes um, with, you know, all kinds of permutations and combinations. And if you were to look at your storage, you may have scale out uh, open source, you may have scale out proprietary, and you may have you know, the SAN and NAS scale-up appliances as well. Um, if you were to look at just the infrastructure itself, if you were to assume that it is uniform, it is completely uh, a myth, right? Um, then you, on top of it, um, if you bring in the workloads, workloads are not going to be just uniform set of workloads. You are going to deploy wide variety of workloads. I call them as, uh, you know, a blender effect, right? So if you have wide variety of workloads that are actually deployed, um, on OpenStack, you essentially need to have some way of managing the quality uh, and partitioning the workloads and dropping the workloads you know, on the right infrastructure that can actually service the workloads. Um, so for example, um, if you were to look at just a brute force way of doing, um, I can create a volume, and I can create a volume across the board on any one of the storage appliances. But why would I buy a very expensive flash array um, and I put a workload that it does not really require. Um, ideally, you would like to partition your infrastructure based on the quality of service that it provides, and you should be able to deploy the workloads based on what the workload requires as opposed to a very brute force mapping process. Um, what it gives you is, one is it actually addresses the application performance requirements, um, it could be in the, uh, you know, performance, reliability, availability, um, all kinds of, you know, attributes associated with it. Things like how many IOPS I want and, you know, what could be the throughput I am looking for for my workload, et cetera, um, as well as optimize your infrastructure capacity. So having rich constructs to explain what your workload requires as opposed to what infrastructure capacity you want on which node or which appliance you want to create is the, is the stuff that we really want to move away from. So describing the workload requirements using service level objectives um, as a way to meet your SLAs and then having that intelligence in the middle, which is what I call software-defined infrastructure. Um, software-defined storage is one of the critical building blocks in it to be able to carve out the resources and allocate the resources much more intelligently to meet your application requirements as well as optimize infrastructure to you know, reduce the cost both on CapEx and OpEx. That is the key to be able to move into the enterprise workloads for OpenStack. Okay. Anyone want to add anything to that? Okay. Next. So uh, I fully agree with uh, what you said, but um, in addition to uh, the, the capacity of expressing the requirements of a given deployment for, uh, for its storage, you also have, with OpenStack, the ability to define complete stacks that will integrate various components which may require different types of storage. And 
the expression of the complexity, whether it is ex expressed with a variety of Docker containers or within a heat template, uh, and the capacity that we have to link some of it to a very fast Manila uh, back storage or to a fairly slow uh, object storage or to a medium uh, uh, open source, uh, very scalable uh, storage depending on the type of component is also the kind of thing that the user expect. They want their app. They don't want uh, to know what backend needs to be suitable for MySQL or for this uh, other database or for the, the shared file system. And hiding the complexity uh, is what the APIs that we are piling up uh, is giving us, and this API having the ability to access different service classes is really the, the key to success. Yeah, I would, just, I would just add to that, and it goes along with the, the baby in the bathwater, is a lot of our enterprise customers look at the journey to OpenStack as being a relatively risky one. Um, they're looking at completely restructuring their entire data center, data center infrastructure around a new set of APIs, around a new set of uh, way of delivering services to the end user, uh, which typically is a line of business um, who, who, who pays the freight. Um, and I think, quite honestly, one of the things they're looking at is how can I de-risk the, can, how can I de-risk that journey? And so the first step is let's not throw out everything. Um, there are some things that work pretty well. Uh, there are some things that are solid and. Uh, there are some things that I know aren't going to lose my data because they haven't lost my data for the last 10, 15 years. Um, I'm not sure that when I go on this very risky reconstruction of my data center that I want to bet that much on, on, on the data. Um, so I think there's, it's not necessarily being risk averse, it's just recognizing what's the value of an enterprise storage solution and what it can do for me um, as I move into this new, in this new infrastructure. Thanks, Pete. So um, that was very well covered. I don't have a thing to add. Uh, the, uh, so, and you've actually even touched a little bit on the next question I was going to ask, but I want to see if there's anything more you'd like to, to pull out of that is, is how can enterprise storage features that are there provide capabilities that OpenStack alone but, you know, by itself can't get to? And uh, I know, Manu, you've, you've been around this industry for a long time. I thought maybe you could... Sure. So um, the way I look at it is what OpenStack is allowing you is basically giving you the flexibility to apply to your workload the characteristics that that workload needs. And in OpenStack, for example, there is a way where you can specify that for my, let's say you are deploying an Oracle workload, you can actually specify the QoS capabilities of that workload. And the way you do it is using the extra spec. So that in some ways allows you to exploit the enterprise capabilities of a backend array that is probably or may not be provided by, let's say, an open source storage software. And a lot of, since I've been, like you know, Jeff said, I've been in the industry for a long time, providing QoS capabilities at a volume level is not easy. Um, there, you know, it's, it's, like I said, I've been in the industry 24 years. It's taken a long time for the industry and for the enterprise backend systems to at least provide that capability today. And you can actually leverage that capabilities from these enterprise arrays and percolate it up to your applications. So you can now, if you have multi-tenancy and you want certain workloads with certain capabilities for throughput and bandwidth and priorities, you can actually request those parameters. And if the backend array provides that capability, you can now extend it to your application. So this is where I see OpenStack, the marriage between OpenStack and the enterprise arrays today has a useful outcome. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree. Um, while there are plan th there is active effort going on in enabling the enterprise um, array features all the way to the top tier to be able to actually deploy your applications, um, I still think there is a lot more work to be done in this area. Um, you know, so for example, you may have um, extremely advanced um, 
you know, replication technology. You should be able to bubble it up, and you should be able to consume that. Um, I would not say that the enterprise plumbing and features that are available in OpenStack today are complete by in itself, but we are definitely on the right path. Um, I wouldn't say it is the end, but it is the beginning of the journey. Right. Anything else to add? So I think the only thing I would add to that is, is really it's the, the basic blocking and tackling of it all. I, I know uh, our chief scientist talks about you know, 25% of, of the code that we work is to make inherently unreliable drives reliable for enterprise applications. So that's, that's just stuff that you don't even think about and, and the testing, all the corner cases, and there's a lot of, a lot of thought, and as, as Mona mentioned, you know, there's many uh, now decades of, of effort that have gone into specifically tuning on, on that component. And, uh, you know, that actually goes back to the baby in the bathwater kind of idea as well. So there's, there's things that are, I guess, should not be taken for granted as, as you move along, and I think just to underline this, that same point. Uh, so what I want to actually ask the audience here uh, a question, and, uh, you know, is, you know we're, all, we're all here. We're here for, uh, I think, for the same reason, um, to contribute, to learn. Uh, to make new partnerships. Um, what are you all finding is, um, let me ask it so we can get a, sh a show of hands. Um, how many of you are finding some resistance when you go back to your organizations regarding OpenStack and, and having OpenStack adopted uh, in your organizations? Okay, that's great. So, so everybody else is smooth sailing and, and all we're just in pure execution mode. We're back to the home front thing. We struggled in the beginning. Okay, so we're it was tougher in the beginning. <laughs> okay. So some of us have not done enough to really know one way or the other yet. Okay, so if you can't hear the the, the response was some of us haven't got far enough along to, to know yet. So you haven't hit it. Um, I, actually, I should have kind of asked who's in the audience a little bit. So uh, how many of you are, are from enterprises and you're looking to use OpenStack? Okay, pretty good number. And, and how many of you are, are, are on the, the vendor side? Okay, a little bit more. And, and then how many of you are developers? Okay, pretty good mix. Kind of like the OpenStack community. Um, so, okay, great. Um, just what are you guys finding uh, when you go out uh, and talk to your customers? Where, where are we on the maturity curve? So the clear answer to that question is no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's, um, quite honestly, the, a lot of the enterprises that we work with have, have built up these silos of expertise. So you have the storage silo, you have the networking silo, you have the compute silo, you have the Windows silo, the Linux silo, whatever. Um, and and, and that goes back to one of my comments earlier, is that one of the ways to get around that is you tell the storage guy, don't worry, OpenStack will work with your vendor of choice for the storage area network. Um, so again, uh, uh, as opposed to telling somebody you, you have to rip out everything and start all over again, um, you can at least de-risk the, de the option. And we've had customers that actually have started down the path of, of, of doing OpenStack, not with us. They started down the path um, and then run into problems. And the first thing we actually helped them go through was how do you get everybody in the organization lined up? Because OpenStack is not just compute, it's not just networking, it's not just storage, it's everything, and it completely touches how you do business once you've once you've deployed it. Um, so having enterprise storage that the storage guy feels comfortable with is important, just as it's important to go by get buy-in from the networking guy that the way you're going to deploy this is going to, is going to comply with their existing, existing um, policies and procedures. So I don't know if you intended that, but uh, Alexi, who is sitting right over there, and I are doing a, a session called uh, Don't Change My Mindset. I'm not that open. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just about how do you Perfect. go uh, across deploying OpenStack in an organization which, by nature, will be resisting to change. All organizations have this uh, natural resistance to change, and 
we've got to deploy treasure of imagination to go against that. Pete uh, touched on a, a couple ways uh, to, to change that. And the resistance can be, happen at many levels. Uh, it can happen at the, the guy handling the storage area network to the application developer that certainly doesn't want to have anything to do with re reli uh, reliability of his application, to uh, the manager that is used to give order in a given way and the, the, the fact that now there is an API, he has no more order to give, uh, all these guys are going to be resisting, and you've got to find a way to go around this resistance. And, and that's what really makes the project fun, because without that, it would only be technical. And technical is fun, but only for a while. Um, let me share my experience in the uh, manufacturing. I, as I intro, um, introduced myself in the beginning, I worked in manufacturing. I have seen the evolution from uh, running a factory completely on bare metal uh, to a virtualized, virtualized infrastructure. But the storyline goes like this, right? So you are actually running everything on bare metal. Um, how would you go actually transition um, an organization that is completely focused towards high reliability, mission critical, nonstop operations, and move towards uh, an infrastructure that really gets you flexibility, right? So. Um, on one side, it may give you the flexibility, but on the other side, uh, your business priorities are completely orthogonal sometimes. So you will have to kind of strike a balance between those two. Um, so typically my experience has been with my cust the customers that I normally deal with. Um, you cherry pick, you know, essentially the place where you really want to start off. Um, you normally don't go and say, hey, I'm going to take OpenStack, put it in enter you know, production workloads, my line of business type of workloads, and see what happens, right? That's not going to happen. Uh, you typically start off with something that is low risk, uh, where you can actually show the value prop, um, get the organizations into more of, uh, move into the culture of how you kind of, um, you know, train them with, uh, DevOps type of mentality with OpenStack, it's open source implementation, the stability aspects, and the, you know, the whole team coming um, and understanding the aspects of how do you deploy it, how do you maintain it, how do you sustain it. All those things will need to be organically grown as opposed to a disruptive way. Um, typically, you start off with a, you know, something that's uh, low risk, and you kind of slowly go into you know, tier two workloads, tier three workloads, where you really are running the line of business apps. Um, it's, uh, the change is not going to happen overnight, but you want to start somewhere. Um, and I have seen with most of the customers, they start with low risk, low profile type of workloads, um, show that you can really make it happen, and then start actually deploying the other ones, right? So that's one element. The second one is, if you look at enterprise, it's not like you have one data center, you have one portfolio of applications, you deploy OpenStack, everything will work seamlessly. You have lots of these org boundaries as well, um, lots of support boundaries, lots of QA boundaries. Um, you are not going to see one OpenStack instance that is deployed in a data center, you're going to see many of them. Um, you, you know, my recommendation is start small, look for low risk, uh, high visibility type of opportunities where you can add value, show value, um, and then move from there. So in my experience, um, I've actually met the spectrum. Some people that don't know anything about it, but would love to learn what is OpenStack. And a part of it I felt is evangelizing this notion. And as soon as you relate that they can create environments like Amazon and Google, they get extremely excited about it. Then there are, of course, other people in the middle that I've met that know a little bit, have tried. Um, some, of course, you know, it's appealed to them. The challenge has actually appealed to them. And when they found out, oh, I can do this myself, and I don't have to rely on a third-party software, it's really gotten them excited. And some, it's like, no, can you put this in an appliance and send it to me? And so, you know, with HP, everything is possible, right? And so that approach appeals to them. And then I've met the extreme on the right hand who love this product, have actually put together an entire business unit that is actually working on open source, open stack products. So I've really seen this spectrum. And I think what I've taken away from this spectrum is 
that OpenStack is, I, I don't know how many of you, it reminds me of my early days, and now you know my age, of course, but when I was doing, at IBM, I was doing the virtualization product, and the idea there was that, you know, hardware is going to get commoditized, dollar per gig is going to go down, and the intelligence is really in the software. So let's take the software and build virtualization engines that can do all the functions of what multi-million dollar arrays can do. And then people would say, well, why should I put this thing in the middle? You know, it's only going to increase my latencies. And we had to do a lot of evangelization. But it was innovation at that time. And I feel the same way with OpenStack. People are still learning about it. There's a lot of power in it. Those that can see how they can extend this flexibility and create that environment are getting extremely attracted to this. And some of them have already learned the power of OpenStack and are actually using it and developing their own insight or are going after companies that are already established and putting it in for them. So again, my range has been a spectrum and I'm really excited to see and I think looking at the number of people that attended this conference more than what were at Paris, it really tells me that we are on our way to something really cool. Yeah, certainly agree. So another thing we hear on this topic is, yeah, it's not about free, but it's about the freedom to, to build what you need to build. Um, so I'm, another way of looking at that, though, is there's the potential for decision paralysis. And, and we have, you know, the, the choices are, are mind-boggling. And a lot of times I, I get this question is, is, so where do I start? In fact, I just walked out of a meeting with a customer, and that was the kind of, kind of where we started was, what do you recommend? Where do we go? And uh, how do we get started? So I'm curious what your experiences have been around decision paralysis, how do, how do we make it easy, are there best practices, how can we simplify this so that it is more consumable? Uh, I know that that's a major theme across, but I'm, since I have these experts here, I wanted to hear from you all. So um, we've actually been shipping an OpenStack distribution since Essex. Uh, we're on our, our fifth release currently. Um, and we've actually been shipping Ceph as part of that um, as well as Swift since since the beginning, and it was exactly that point. Um, in, in the Essex days, um, NetApp was about the only um, option for back-end storage other than Ceph, and so we had some customers that quite honestly, much to Jeff's chagrin, were not NetApp customers, so um, we didn't really feel like we had to go tell them they needed to go buy a NetApp um, array if they wanted to use, if they wanted to use Nova and Glance and things like that. Um, and, and, but as, as people have bought into the notion that um, you want to have the flexibility and the vendors have participated, they now have pretty much, um, if you're using HP, you're using IBM, you're using uh, Hitachi, um, NetApp, EMC, whatever storage array you're using today, you can take advantage of that as you start going down the path, but you may have some tier three data that you're fully comfortable with putting it on something like Swift or Ceph um, that doesn't necessarily have the same performance and uh, per performance parameters that you get with your existing uh, storage array. So I absolutely do think that, that the way that the community has, has, has reacted has been very positive. And quite honestly, the, the, the array vendors could have said, yeah, we're not gonna play with this stuff um, because it's, it's potentially disruptive to their business models, but they've all stepped up, they've all participated. Um, they're all trying to figure out how they can provide the same level of feature functionality or, or provide their feature functionality um, in a way that's consumable by the open by the OpenStack consumer, um, and and provide that kind of that kind of flexibility. I think there is. Uh, I've been expressing that in uh, other summits that there is a, somewhat of a close link between the transformation that needs to happen uh, when you deploy uh, an OpenStack cloud and agility. So I, I've been using over and over again in order to define what is needed at the technical level, a technique which is to uh, get to understand very precisely what are the requirements, what are the use cases 
that uh, someone needs to implement before making any recommendation. And by driving uh, this uh, on, uh, from a top to bottom approach, you are making sure that you're not missing on the actual business reason why you will want to run OpenStack. And this is really the key. If you are not focusing on what is going to be the end result, what is going to be the output of the wonderful factory that you're building uh, based on OpenStack, you're missing the point. And therefore, the, the, the freedom that we have below is to support the output that we want to produce. And once you've got the, a good vision of what's the business case, what's the output that you want, I think the choices just fall into place. Yeah, so um, I don't know if, if it, 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 to me it is more about a choice, right? So the fundamental thing as if I were to consume OpenStack, a um, couple of things actually come out very strong. One is uh, the, it's about choice and it's about um, on-demand uh, deployment of your infrastructure. Um, now the next question is going to be, you know, what, uh, what do I have that is already deployed um, can I actually uh, take OpenStack and integrate the existing solutions that I already have in my data center? If it is specifically within the context of storage, I may have NetApp filers, for example. Um, I may have EMC stuff in it. Can I actually take the plugins and, you know, can I actually uh, integrate those uh, systems and consume them without actually doing a lot of acrobatic work? So the key is that uh, you know, the distros, OpenStack distros, cannot be biased towards, I have Swift and I have Ceph. Um, but in reality, the enterprise customers are looking for, I have already invested a significant am amount of capital. My enterprise workloads are running on the higher end, um, high uh, mature platforms and storage infrastructure go goes along those lines. I need to have a way to manage them as well. So it cannot be skewed towards just open source only, top to bottom, but it has to be more of opening up the innovation across the pipeline. And specifically on the distros, what I see is there is a trend. If you were to look at Mirantis, Red Hat distros, Suze distros, you will see all these plugins emerging, uh, which is an extremely a positive sign in my view um, as a way to consume the existing investments without actually doing a whole lot of uh, work um, and heavy lifting, which is key to you know, uh, drive the implementations for the enterprise adoption. It's a simplifying decision. Exactly. Simplifying yeah. is extremely important. Um, I think someone was making the comment in the conference, you, know, you don't need a PhD to manage OpenStack. You've got to continue to tone it down to make it more and more use usable. It's not about making it usable. It is also making it highly integratable as well with the existing infrastructure to be able to consume for enterprise workloads. So actually, if you look, the word freedom actually encapsulates free. But I think it's more about free and the domain that you're going to manage. And the freedom, it gives you uh, the, the powerful message that one customer relayed to me was, if I'm going to use OpenStack, can I build my own applications? Can I actually manipulate the software in the way I want it to go and in the direction I want it to go? And the answer is yes. So what OpenStack is lending to the user is the ability for him to manipulate the software in a manner that can meet his needs. And it's really about understanding what is your use case, what is the pain point, is it allowing you to leverage the infrastructure that you have, and the fourth important key aspect that I've observed is that it allows you to work with your commoditized hardware. And so I think the people do see that it gives them an ability to use OpenStack to create new innovations. And to me, that is the power that OpenStack is actually bringing to the customer. Okay, thanks. That is. So, I, so I, I, what I want to do is, is point out two things on to this last question. Um, we're, we're now shipping, uh, or will be shipping in the near future, uh, 
the FlexPod concept with OpenStack built on top of FlexPod, which is a, a simplifying assumption. I know, Mono, you mentioned that HP has a similar capability. Uh, so there's choice at that of, of integrations. I'd also say that we have, uh, with SAP, um, built on top of SUSE, we have application stacks starting to build out and, and having that, um, that kind of simplification as well. So with that, I'll, I'll finish. Uh, are we there yet? I'd say we've got a ways to go, but we're, uh, we're well on our way. So thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll see you around the show. Thank you. <laughs>